Okay, uh, now we're going to be having Bruce Mary. She's going to be speaking about something on the complete other side of life, um, his experiences of using Boost, Pyth Boost Python. Yes, right. Okay. Right, so a uh, bit about myself. I'm working at the SKA South Africa. It means I don't actually work on the SKA at all. I work on Meerkat, which is a precursor instrument to the Square Kilometer Array Telescope. So just a quick bit of background about what led me to this. Um, what is Meerkat? Uh, it's a large, uh, locally built radio telescope, which will eventually consist of 64 dishes. That's a picture of one of the dishes. That's a 13 meter diameter structure. So these are fairly large things sitting out in the middle of nowhere in the Karoo. Uh, you can see we've got ready to build a whole bunch of them. We haven't actually built very many of them yet, but that's the sort of core site that all the um, places, uh, which all those things we're gonna build them on. And, right, so what does Python have to do with all that? Well, radio astronomy actually involves a lot of computing these days because um, we use interferometry, which uh, is very much data processing. And one of the tools we use is a protocol which was defined many years ago before my time for much smaller instruments called Streaming Protocol for Exchange of Astronomical Data. And the names of this complete misnomer because there's nothing in the protocol that's in any way astronomy related. It's just uh, we layer on top of that to transport astronomical data. It's really a streaming protocol for throwing NumPy arrays around. So you set up descriptors to say, here's the shape of my array, here's the data type. We even use the NumPy data type um, descriptors in the protocol. And then you start slinging data around. It's a little bit different from sort of traditional high performance networking things. If you go online and start reading about how to get the most out of your 40 gigabit Ethernet adapter, everyone seems to be using them for sort of network security, packet monitoring, and then they've got thousands of flows of tiny little packets. We've got um, very few flows, but the flows are extremely high bandwidth. You know, um, for example, flows off a digitizer will have one flow with 17 gigabits a second. So we need a lot of performance out of that. Uh, it's kind of interesting, it's a lossy UDP protocol because you know, we just collect lots of data. If we lose a few bits here and there, it doesn't really matter. And it's coming off FPGAs in a lot of cases and it's just too complicated to build a TCP stack in an FPGA. So and we had a library for doing this, but it was kind of slow and buggy and wasn't really suiting our needs, so I set out to write a new version. And because of these extreme performance requirements, I wanted to write the core of it in C++. And in fact, some of the tools that are going to use this are actually going to use the C++ library and then have Python bindings to it. So we needed, so I set out to say, well, okay, let's see what tools I'm going to use to write uh, the interface between Python and the C++ library. So I'm going to show you some examples of different things I tried. And to do that, I'll just pick a very trivial library and just show you some actual code. So these slides are gonna have lots and lots of code. If you want slides about Boost Python that just tell you about philosophy and things, um, James Saunders gave a talk sort of about three years ago at Python ZA, you can always dig that up. So here's a really trivial library with some Monty Python compliant naming. Uh, we've got a parrot class in a pet shop name space, and you can put some bolts through it. And if you put at least four million volts through it, it might go boom. So we've got a class, we've got a function, we've got a getter and setter thing. That's obviously not very Pythonic. We want to wrap that up in some sort of property. So let's see some different ways to do that. First is going to be this, the raw Python C API, which for C Python is kind of what everything sits on top of at the bottom. And it's very easy. You just write sort of 100 lines of code like that. Um, no, don't do that. It's horrible, it's really horrible. I had to go and figure out how to make extra small fonts in LaTeX just to put that slide up. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's highly unpleasant. So, and that's why you've got so many different things people have built on top of it in order to make it easier for you. So the first one I'll mention is something called Scython, which is sort of an interesting idea. They've, you write in a language which looks like Python, but is actually a superset of Python. And so you've got two parts to it. This PXD file is a description of your C API that, or C++ API that you're wrapping. 
and then you write some sort of extended Python code, and you can pilot the Cython into a C file, which will look something like that previous slide, except even more horrible because it's come out of a generator. And then you compile it as you would a normal C API extension. So let's see what that would look like. So we've got a definition of our API where we've got all sorts of new syntax you've got to learn, but basically it's telling you what header file it comes from, what C++ namespace it's in, what your C++ class is, tell it what your methods are. And that will wrap it up into not something you can call from Python, but it will wrap it up in something you can call from Cython. And then you have to write another wrapper where you write a Cython class, which but this class you can call from Python, and the Cython class wraps up your actual underlying class, and you've got to sort of write all these wrapper methods around things and declare your properties, and if you use the decorator form of at property, it doesn't work, so it's all, you know, it works. It's definitely better than using the raw C Python API, but you've got to sort of wrap everything twice, which is slightly painful. And my main objection to it is it's confusing as hell about whether what you're writing is Cython code that you can call from Cython or whether you're actually defining something that's accessible from Python or which way things go. I find it very confusing. And also, if something goes wrong, the error messages are just completely incomprehensible. So actually, uh, this is something I got from my early abortive attempts to wrap the C++ API I'd written in Cython. I just could not make it work. In fact, this is got from the slides with a more recent version of Cython. At the time I wrote it, there was an older version of Cython which exploded even more spectacularly. It would generate your C file with your extension, but it wouldn't be valid C. It would just, then the C compiler would uh, throw up on it, and you had no idea why. So I'm not totally enamored of Cython, but in some cases it might work for you. Um, right. So then the other one I ended up using was Boost Python, and Take a guess, just in your head, how many lines of code do you think we're going to need to wrap up that C++ API? Uh, sort of a number? That's it. That's everything you have to write to wrap up that C++ API. Uh, there's some boilerplate with header files and namespaces. You tell it I want to wrap that C++ class. You tell it what you want that class to be called in Python. Mostly it'll be the same, but maybe you want to change from whatever naming conventions you had in your C++ library to more Pythonic naming conventions. And define a function, tell what the function is, and even getters and setters, you tell it you want that to be a property, you tell it what the getter and setter are. And it will give you a Python class, and off you go. Oh, um, so I cut the section down a bit because I was a bit worried about the time before Simon said, please run over so we can stagger out the lunch. So I'll briefly mention a few other things. So uh, much I mentioned CFFI and the sort of C types, which is an older, less intelligent version which doesn't actually use a compiler and for a C API yes that's great something like this it's a real pain I've got examples which are on github together with the slides you basically have to take that C++ API write a C API wrap around it which sort of has allocators and deallocators for your class and wrappers for the functions then you use CFFI to wrap that up into Python land which then gives you a bunch of functions but it doesn't give you a class then you wrap that up in a class, which then calls out to those free functions. And you get there eventually, but it's, again, a lot of layers and layers and layers in order to actually get anywhere. Um, but yeah, if you want to do support PyPy, that would be the way to do it. Most of this other stuff I don't think supports PyPy. Uh, Swig is one I didn't actually investigate at all. I just sort of spent five minutes looking at the web page when I was writing the slides but it looks like it does actually understand C++ and templates and things like that. But uh, Swig is kind of an everything to everything wrapper, or at least C and C++ to everything, so you can use it to create like Ruby bindings or Perl bindings, and it's been around for like 20 years or something. So it's a bit like Cython in that you have to write in this funny meta language to describe your API. But it looks like it might be useful, so it's worth a look if you investigating this. Weave is something that's part of SciPy, although you can use standalone. I've not really looked at it at all. I think you basically just sort of write bits of C in your Python code uh, strings, which then go goes off and compiles and you can call. Uh, if you're interested in that, my colleague Mathieu here has got some experience with it. Okay. Uh, right, so to summarize, I, I had a bunch of things I ideally wanted. Um, 
this, this table I actually sort of made after the fact, but it mirrored my thinking, which was I want something that understands C++ that can wrap my class without going via C. It'd be nice if something supported PyPy, but actually we use a lot of these numeric Python things, NumPy and SciPy, and use a bunch of other packages, which are Python C API extensions, so they don't work in PyPy, so that was less important to me. I didn't want to have to learn a whole bunch of new syntax. I've spent many years learning how to write Python. I understand the syntax. I've spent even more years writing C++. I understand that syntax. Uh, Cython confused the heck out of me. So I didn't want to have to learn that. It would also be nice, ideally, if our users didn't have to go and install other packages to actually use this extension, if they can just pip install it. Uh, but actually, you know, we're only using this in-house. We control our environment, so it's not the end of the world. See if is not too bad, you can just pip install it. Boosts a bit more of a pain because it's actually a system library. But so you just app get install it. Using Windows, mm, don't, don't do that. Yeah. Uh, right, and the bad news is it looks like you can only pick two. So Boost Python was uh, matched the, the two that I particularly want, cared about more. So that's what I went with. And also, as you saw in the example earlier, it's incredibly compact and quite powerful. Okay, so the next section of the talk is going to be just about Boost Python. Uh, it's not really going to be a tutorial. You know, go and look on the Boost Python website if you want a tutorial. Uh, I'm going to look at some of the things it doesn't really solve that well and how I worked around that. But I'll, look, I'll sort of show you some of the stuff it can do nice and easily. Um, you can add keyword arguments. So previously with that simple example I showed, you know, I wrapped up the function, but I didn't tell it what name the argument had. So if you tried to call it with a keyword argument instead of just a positional argument, it wouldn't work. But you can tell it what your arguments are called. And you can also specify defaults for them. So that if you don't specify the arguments for Python, it fills in the default. That works nice and easy. Uh, the only thing I've shown it here, you can also add a doc string to this. You just pass string as an extra parameter, and you get a doc string. Uh, one of the really nice things is it can map C++ exceptions into Python exceptions uh, for you so that you don't have to litter your code everywhere with, oh, call this thing. Ooh, did it fail? Okay, pi uh, error set the exception to this thing and then jump out. You can just throw a C++ exception. And as long as you've told it how to handle that exception or how to map that exception into Python land, it'll do it for you. And it already maps sort of the core C++ exception types. So like if you throw a C++ invalid argument exception, your Python code will just get a value error. It just does that. Um, what I wanted was, in this API, I wanted to have an iterator that you could sort of use from Python. And if you look at how generators or iterators work internally, uh, when you get to the end of your iterator, it has to throw a stop exception in Python. So I just created a C++ exception called stop iteration. So that's what it's called. And then you can just register a translator. So this basically says, if you get this C++ exception, call this function to set the corresponding Python exception. And no, I've the wrong button there. Okay. Um, also, if you've got operator overloads in your C++, you can map them into Python very easily. So self just means an object of this type that we're defining. So this now is saying, take my operator equals equals that I've defined in C++ and provide it in Python. And my operator not equal. So that's nice and easy. Uh, you can also call into Python from C++ code very easily. It basically, you've got a class called um, object, and that implements all the sort of Python things you can get, sometimes in slightly different names. So you'll see there's dot .atter, which is basically just the dot operator in Python. That's basically saying, take the item object, look inside it, and give me the ID attribute from that object. In this case, I'm actually getting the two buffer function, and then I've got Parentheses, that means that's a function call. So just that easily you can call into Python. It'll marshal up any arguments you happen to put in between the brackets. And then also if you've got a Python object, in this case the ID, which is a Python integer, you can say, I want to just convert that to a you know, C++ 64-bit int. And it'll go and look in its uh, database of converters and either convert it for you or it'll throw an exception. It'll just propagate out and you get a value error. 
So all of these things are so much easier in the loose Python than using the raw API where you'd have to basically construct an argument tuple and then construct each parameter and stick it in your tuple and then God knows what else. So, and to make it even easier, it's also got wrappers for some of the Python types. So I had a function, well, I've got a class called heap which has a get items function which returns a C++ vector. But obviously in Python, you want that as a list. So I've wrapped that function up into a function which returns a list. And this class has all the Python list um, API available in the C++. So um, you can see I just declare the list and then I call dot append on that list. And that appends to the Python list. So I'm essentially just copying stuff from a C++ vector into a Python list. Right, okay. So that was just showing you that the easy stuff is actually really easy. Now we're going to show you that the hard stuff is still possible. So as Maciej mentioned, uh, in this Python C API, you have to manage all the reference counting yourself. Uh, which basically, so every object has a reference count, which says how many things are still using this object. Once it drops to zero, that means no one's using it. You can throw it away. And when you're just using normal Python, that's completely transparent. The interpreter handles that for you. But if you're mucking about with C API, Python doesn't know what you're doing with objects underneath. You've got to tell it when you're holding on to an object and you don't want it to go away. And, and as, uh, as Macho says, that's where a lot of bugs come in because on some code path, you'll forget to decrement a reference somewhere or you'll forget to increment a reference somewhere and everything will explode or you'll have a memory leak because you forgot to release a reference. So, I don't know if any of you use any sort of smart pointer classes in C++. Okay, so Boost has a smart pointer or smart handle for Python objects. So, it just magically happens for you. When you sort of copy this handle, it will increment the reference count. If you, when the handle goes away because of the C++ destructor, it decrements the reference count. Mostly, you can just forget about reference counting. And there's one catch I ran into, which is because it's so transparent, you sometimes don't know it's happening when it shouldn't happen, which is, oh, I kind of reeled it slightly a bit, but if you've dropped the global interpreter lock, then you're not allowed to call the Python C API at all. And that means that if you copy one of these things, it's going to, or destroy one of these things, it's going to, without you even noticing, it's going to call into the Python C API when you're not allowed to. And then you're going to get all sorts of fun and entertaining bugs. So the other thing that's, r for me, really the test of any kind of um, interpreted language to C++ wrapping system is how does it handle the case of when your C++ objects are referring to each other? And how, does, how do you reflect that into Python to make sure that the corresponding Python objects are kept around so that the Python so that your objects don't just suddenly disappear without you not expecting it. So I've got another example here. Um, you've got two classes. You've got a flowers class, which just has some sort of name. And you've got a vase, which has a reference to some flowers that might be sitting in the vase. And you've got a function set content, which says stick these flowers in the vase. And if you're familiar with Monty Python, just picture the, the Gumby flower arranging sketch. OK. So what we want to have happen is, and the problem is because this is just dealing with raw pointers, there's nothing at the C level to make sure that the flowers don't just get deallocated, which will happen if the corresponding Python object has its reference count dropped to zero. So we need some range for Python to hang on to the flowers for us. So let's see what happens if we don't do that. Uh, we've got a simple wrapper. We've declared the flowers class and the vars class and that function, but we haven't told it anything about this lifetime management. Uh, so we can try it and we can have a vars, we can string it, okay, so it's empty, that's fine. We can put some flowers in it, let's try and string it and it crashes. And that's because this flowers object was created here, got passed to the function and immediately disappeared again. So now the vars is pointing at some memory that's been freed. So we need to take care of that. Boost Python has a tool for this, it, and I'll show you it's not quite perfect. 
uh, calls it with custodian and ward, and it's part of a more general thing called call policies. When you wrap a function, you can say, here's a function I want to wrap, and here are some policies about how you actually wrap this function. And I won't go into details, the one just, and two just say which arguments this function are, which one owns a reference to which other one. So that's now saying that when you call this function, oh, by the way, this flower is now owning these flowers, please keep track of that. And the implementation is a bit nasty. It does some things, weak references and callbacks. So you actually create a cyclic reference here, which can't be freed. But then once the vase disappears, that triggers, that breaks the weak reference, which triggers the callback, which then releases the reference count on the flowers. There's some issues there. So that's, it doesn't know that this is replacing ownership when you call the set contents. So if you have some sort of loop and you just keep going and re keep replacing the flowers every time, every flowers that you ever put in those vase, it's going to hang on to until the vase is destroyed. So this loop is going to keep leaking flowers as you go around. You'll build up more and more flowers objects and eventually you'll get rid of the vase and it'll be okay. But if you've got some long running service, this is bad. So there's a couple of alternative approaches. One I've used in several places is I've explicitly made the C++ class hold on to a reference count. So I've used the smart uh, reference counting handle class and I've now got the vase to hold the handle to the flowers. In some cases, it's meant I've taken a C++ class that already exists, which doesn't know anything about Python because this is a C++ API, and I've subclassed it to add in this particular uh, wrapper thing. So, and then what I've done is I've implemented my own custom call policy called store handle post call, where I say, once you've, m once you've completed this call, take the handle to the second parameter, which is the flowers, stick it in the vase, and here's a pointer to the uh, handle element in that vase. So you can find the implementation of this thing in the speed to source code. It's on GitHub. It's LGPL licensed. It's a bit much to stick on a slide. And it sort of gets into all the hairy details of doing the reference counting right and so on. So that solves that problem. Uh, one thing you still have to be careful of is make sure you don't create cycles amongst your C++ objects. So with CPython, CPython can break cyclic references because it has a garbage collector it runs every now and then. But there's no way it can break references between C++ objects. Um, if you're using the low-level Python C API, you can add extra bits to your class to say, actually, I support cyclic garbage collection, and here's a function you can call to interrogate me for my references and track things. Boost Python doesn't actually support that. So just don't create cycles of C++ objects. It's going to end badly, or you're going to leak. OK. That was a bit about object lifetime. Then another bit of fun is Unicode, which uh, Expect we'll hear more from more about from Neil this afternoon, but Python three they changed how strings are handled. So there's two different types in each: one which just has raw bytes, one which stores Unicode code points, and the string type is different. So in Python two, string just has bytes; in Python three, string has Unicode. It's all a little bit messy, and yeah, so and Boost Python, I think, yeah, so Boost Python has converters for a bunch of built in types, including C strings. But what happens is different in Python 2 and Python 3. If you're returning a C string, in Python 2, you just get the bytes back. In Python 3, it'll actually try and interpret your string as UTF 8 and decode it. Now, for a network API, we're slinging a lot of binary data around, and C++ string is actually a fairly handy container for binary data, but we don't. But it's not UTF-8. It's just binary data that's actually some numbers that's going to be in the NumPy array. So what we actually want is some way to say, I've got the string. It's just some binary data. Please give me some raw bytes out of that. So fortunately, Boost Python, you can register your own type converters. Uh, so first, what I actually did is 
just to disambiguate it in my C++ API, I created a new class, which is essentially the same thing as the string class. It's inherited from it, but it's a new class just so that template magic can actually distinguish the classes from each other. So it's a, just think of it as a type that's exactly the same as standard string. So converting from C++ to Python is fairly easy to write a new converter. You just have to, it has to be wrapped up in a class for whatever reason, but you basically just write a function called convert, uh, which takes your type. And then this is the Python C API function, which constructs a Python 3 bytes object from a pointer and how much, how many bytes you're pointing at. And then just in your sort of module registration, where you've ridged everything from the module, you've just got to tell it about this converter. You say, I want you to know how to convert byte string, and here's the function you need to do it. Incidentally, you should avoid registering your own converters for built-in types, because you might have multiple Boost Python modules all sitting in one program. And I actually ran into a bug with this where some other piece of code that um, a colleague was using also used Boost Python, and it registered an exception handler for standard exception. And depending on which order you imported the two modules, that could take priority over my custom exception handlers. And then suddenly my stop iteration didn't work properly because it was going through that handler. So generally you should, should only wrap things that are in your namespace. Otherwise, you might be stomping on other people. Okay, so that's how I handled that string conversion. And I'll talk briefly about the global interpreter lock which is this big evil thing that uh, prevents you from doing decent multi-threading in Python. Because uh, every thread, when it's actually doing anything useful, holds the global interpreter lock. And that gives it some safety, some speed ups in the single-threaded case, but it means you can't really do things in parallel, except um, if you actually, certain operations, you drop the global interpreter lock in C code. And in fact, NumPy, I think, now does this for large operations that will drop the gill so that another thread can also be doing a NumPy operation. You can actually get some multi-threaded speed up. But also the main place you'll see it in kind of Python code is any sort of blocking operation where you're waiting for a network or something. You don't want to be stopping other threads from still doing stuff. So a heap is just the sort of unit of transmission in the speed protocol. And if you're sitting there saying, okay, please wait until the next heap arrives. You can still be getting on with other stuff and other threads, but you have to take care of it. Uh, the other case where you have to worry about the gill is if you have threads which you've created in your C code which aren't Python threads, but they need to call into Python, then they need to take this lock, which they won't have by default. That I've mostly used for logging. So I've got a C thread pool which sort of pulls all these sockets with boost asynchronous IO. And if they want to do any logging, I've actually wired it up into the Python logging framework where one of those threads will lock the gill and then make a logging call into the Python logging framework. So the C API is, a, is typical for C API. It's not really that safe. It's not exception safe. You've got to make sure you balance your lock and releases. And if you forget to unlock, then all hell breaks loose because the Python interpreter can't go on. So I've just written a very simple uh, wrapper which is, you know, nice modern C++ uh, RAII idiom. So when you construct this object, it will release the global interpreter lock. And then when it goes out of scope, it will reacquire the lock. That means if you throw an exception from somewhere in the middle, it will still remember to reacquire the lock. And I've got an equivalent one for if you don't have the lock and you want to now reacquire it or acquire it for a temporary operation and then release it when you destroy it. So then related to that is how do you handle um, interrupts? So I gave a lightning talk about this briefly yesterday, which is if you're doing this sort of thing and you hit control C, what's gonna happen? So we'll, what you really want to happen is it will immediately jump out of that loop, it will give up waiting for a heap, and you'll get a keyboard interrupt exception. However, when I first started writing speed two, what would actually happen is, well, it's sitting in some C code. It's not ready to receive an interrupt handler because it can't get the gill. So nothing happens. And you have to go and kill your program with small prejudice. So 
I briefly mentioned yesterday, what happens when a signal handler arrives is it will actually interrupt your low-level system call. And you can then call this pyr check interrupts function to check if the, ex to, well, A, give the signal handler a chance to run, and it'll also tell you if it threw an exception or not. And if it did throw an exception, you want to jump out and let the exception happening rather than retrying your system call. So a bit of code here. These slides are all going to be online if you want to look through it in more detail later. But basically, you release the lock, you make your system call, and if it's interrupted, you have to reacquire the lock before you can call that function. If it was, then there's this C++ exception called error already set. And that basically means that the Python error flag, or error object, has already been set. And the boost Python exception wrapping doesn't have to do anything because it just jumps back into Python and Python will see the exception which came from inside here, which may have been from your signal handler. And otherwise, if, if you weren't interrupted, if there was some actual error, then you probably want to set an OS error from whatever your error number was from your failed system call. That's the general pattern I've been using. Uh, you do need to make sure for that that you're actually using operating system level calls. If you're using something like POSIX um, condition variables, you're not guaranteed to be going into the operating system for that. So I've had to use pipes in some places where I would have used condition variables otherwise. Okay, so just to summarize the good and the bad, uh, this is, I think, the best thing since sliced cheese for integrating C++ classes into Python, whether it's C++ that you've written specifically to be wrapped into Python or whether it's just some existing API. Uh, it doesn't cover everything, it doesn't wrap everything in the Python C API, so you still sometimes have to call the Python C API, probably much to much as horror, it'll make these things more difficult to port to PyPy. And you don't have to learn some new language you do kind of have to learn some new syntax just because there's some hairy metaprogramming going on, but you don't have to learn, you know, it's still a normal compiler. It, it's C++. You can figure out what most syntax means. The downsides, you've got some new system library dependency. You now have to app get install boost, but you know, the underlying API speed 2 uses boost asynchronous IO anyway, so there's no extra cost there. Um, if you want to try and extend it and think, oh, I'll just look at how they've implemented this thing and then do something similar, it's terrifying. Don't go there. It's <laughs> metaprogramming that, that will, yeah, nasty. And there's some stuff in the C API which you can't easily do in Boost Python. So like that cyclic garbage, garbage collection I mentioned, also the buffer protocol I found that I wanted to implement it. I wanted to write a class that would implement the Python buffer protocol. You couldn't really do that in Boost Python, but I found a workaround because you just create a NumPy array and NumPy implements the buffer protocol. So that worked okay. And as far as I know, you can't use this with PyPy. So you tie yourself into the C Python again. Right, so, so all these slides and including compilable, you know, pip installable code examples for each of these different interfaces is up on GitHub. And speed2 is available as a uh, package on GitHub as well. Right, questions? Uh, with Cython, you compile to a .so package which you, which you can just import. Um, how does it work with Boost? Uh, what does it compile to? Yeah, so again, it would compile to a .so or presumably DLL or whatever it is on other operating systems. But that SO will have a link dependency on libboost uh, Python, number of your Python version. So it's a bit less portable. Um, and if with the SO package, uh, anyone else on another system can use it straight away, or they need yeah. to also have boost? They need to also have boost, and they need to have the matching version of boost, which is a bit of a pain if you want to create a wheel or something. It, it ends up being fairly specific to an OS distribution. More questions? Sorry, with your example with those uh, dependencies, would you not be able to solve, in at least your example there, by creating a variable that points to flower and keeping that variable around long enough while you're still using it with the vars? Oh, you mean in the Python code? Yeah, so in, the, in the Python code. So you do your memory management in Python, yeah, essentially. So. Uh, 
Yeah, n not example. Yeah. Yeah, you could, but you know the, that means that you're that you're then having to write in your API documentation. Oh yes, and remember to keep this variable around, otherwise your interpreter is going to crash. That that's not <laughs> Pythonic. No, it should just work. Any more questions? So I'm very, very, very proud to say that I was the, the colleague who broke Bruce's <laughs> iterator. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there are no more questions. Um, let's thank Bruce then. Yep. So unfortunately we're still a little bit early.